Hi, I'm Dr. J, and this is a video about simple linear regression. We're talking today about choosing your explanatory variables. This is the second video about simple linear regression. The first video will be up here because you might want to go check that out before checking out this one. Uh, the first one talks about an example that we'll use throughout uh, this particular slide, so it might be worth watching before you watch this one. Now the topic today is about how to choose your explanatory variables and to give you a realization that you have a lot of opportunity to choose what you want for those explanatory variables. And I'm doing this in the context of simple linear regression, but there's no reason that we have to be limited to that context. And in fact, if you use these types of variables in uh, multiple regression, that's just fine. All right, so I just want a quick reminder. This is our simple linear regression model. The model basically says we have an observation or a response variable y. It's independent, it's normally distributed, it has a mean beta naught plus beta one times the explanatory variable value, that's the xi, and it has a variance of sigma squared. And now previously we talked about how to interpret this model uh, if you just have an explanatory variable and you put it in. But really this model is much more flexible that it may seem at first glance. And the reason that it's much more flexible is that you have complete flexibility in what to choose for this new f, right? So I just changed the model and I put in an f of x. So you have been given some explanatory variable x, but really any function of that explanatory variable is fine and can be put in the model. So we're gonna to talk today about uh, four particular special cases that come up relatively frequently and therefore might be of interest. So uh, the first choice is that you use the quadratic function. So instead of putting in x, you actually put in x squared. Uh, the second is the logarithmic function. So instead of putting in x, you put in log x. Uh, then the last two are, uh, one is typically called centered, but basically if you ever subtract a value m, oftentimes that m is the mean of your explanatory variable, and that's what we typically mean when we say the word centered. Uh, and then the last one is to rescale. That is, you divide your explanatory variable x by some value s. Um, usually that is a standard deviation, but it could be whatever you want it to be. And so we're just gonna go through these four examples and see how that changes what your model looks like and how you might interpret the model parameters. All right, so uh, here are the types of plots I'm gonna show throughout the video. The top plot is always gonna be a plot of y versus that function. In this case, that function is the quadratic function, so we have x squared. And you'll notice that because we have a linear model, there's a linear, linear relationship between the response and that function x. But now if we go and we look at the relationship that we have between y and the actual explanatory variable that we cared about in the first place, that is x, so the y versus x relationship, now we can see that quadratic curve. And so this is just an example where this function uh, allows you to model more complicated relationships than just a simple line, right? So instead of just being that simple line, we now have a quadratic relationship. Similarly, if instead of using the quadratic function, we use the logarithmic function, then on the top plot, we're going to see a linear relationship between our response and our logarithmic function. In the bottom facet, we are going to see that logarithmic curve uh, demonstrating the relationship between the response and the explanatory variable x. So that's just a couple of examples, um, but you could do many more examples. You maybe want the exponential function rather than the logarithmic function. Uh, perhaps for some application you want x cubed, right? So you have a lot of choices there for what you want to choose for that function, and therefore a lot of flexibility even within this simple linear regression model framework. All right, now let's talk about um, that x minus m function. I'm going to refer to this as shifting the intercept. And the reason is because you'll see in a moment that this function has the effect of changing the interpretation that you have for the intercept. As a reminder, the intercept is the expected response when the explanatory variable is zero. And so if we decide to use the function x minus m as the input into our regression model, well, then what we actually have as an interpretation for that intercept is what the expected response is when the explanatory variable is m. Because if we plug in m for x in this equation, then we have m minus m, that's zero. Okay, so just to uh, reinforce that idea, we can think about 
fitting the model here, beta naught plus beta one times x minus m. So that's the function that we put in there for our explanatory variable. And now we're just going to rearrange pieces a little bit. And we're going to call it this now a new regression of beta tilde zero plus beta one times x. Right? So we could have fit two different regressions. The first one uses x minus m, and the second one with the tildes uses just x. And now there's a relationship between those two, and if you do the math, you can figure out what that relationship is. But the first thing to notice is that the slope is unchanged. Right? There's only one coefficient for x in both of those equations, and it's beta 1 in the first equation, and tilde beta 1 in the second equation. But the intercept does change. The intercept becomes beta uh, tilde beta naught is equal to beta naught minus m beta 1. All right? And so that changing of the intercept has the effect of changing your interpretation for the intercept from on the right example when x is 0 to when x is m in that middle example. All right, so just to further illustrate this, let's take that telomere data set that we looked at last time. So as a quick recap, we have the telomere length as our response on the y-axis. We have our x-axis being the number of years since diagnosis. In the top plot, we have that function of that years, so years minus 5, and on the bottom, we just have years. So the m in this example is now 5. So you'll see in the bottom plot that our intercept is going to be when years is 0, right? And that intercept is something close to about 1.4. In the top plot, because we've shifted the x-axis by 5, that uh, intercept now occurs where the new axis is 0, where in fact years was 5. You can see that it lines up with the plot below it where years was 5. So in the top plot, when years is 5, then the x value in the new regression is 0, and we get a value of about a little bit more than 1.2, it looks like. right? And so that's how we've shifted that intercept. And the interpretation then for the top intercept is that when years is 5, the expected response is 1.2. Alright, so this is an example using R code to do that same process. In the R code, the first regression shows years, the second regression shows that years minus 5. The R syntax for doing this is to use this I function in R. That's just the uh, identical or identity function where it basically tells R hey, yes, we want to do the subtraction here. So it does years minus 5, and then does the calculation. All right, and so we can now do uh, interpret either model, right, and get an understanding of either what happens when years is 0, or what happens when years is 5. All right, let's go through this last example. Last example has us taking the, uh, uh, rescaling the explanatory variable. Just to remind you, the slope, is the expected response when the explanatory variable increases by 1. And so now if we use this functional form here, where we take the explanatory variable and divide by s and use that in a regression, then the new slope from that regression is the expected increase in the response when the explanatory variable increases by s. All right? So to show the mathematics here, right? we have the new regression where we put in x divided by s as our explanatory variable. And then we can do the rearrangement just like we did before. It's actually even a little bit simpler. And the first thing we notice is that the intercept is unchanged. We still have beta naught uh, is equal to beta tilde naught. In contrast, the slope now changes, right? And it changes just by a factor of s. So the beta 1 we have in our new model is the beta 1 tilde in that original model where we had not scaled our explanatory variable s. And the impact here is that it changes our interpretation of the slope from one, an increase of one unit to an increase of s units. Okay, here's uh, applying that example to our telomere data. So if we take a look at our telomere data, again, the bottom plot is our original regression. Then the top plot is where we took the years and divided by two. The plots look identical, but uh, the difference between the two is that the x-axis has been scaled. Hopefully it's right around here somewhere. right? So on the top plot, our x-axis goes from 0 up to 6. In the bottom plot, it goes from 0 to 12.5. right? And what that means is that our slope now has changed by a factor of 2. 
If we run this analysis in R, uh, here's the analysis, and we can see, in fact, that that intercept, sorry, that that slope in our second regression is double. Yep, just checking that it's double the value it was in that first regression. Um, and the, so now that is an indication that uh, the interpretation of that new slope that's doubled, right, is what happens for a doubling of year, not a doubling of years, sorry, uh, when years increases by two rather than when years increases by one. Now, these two are often used in conjunction with each other, this shifting the intercept and rescaling the data. Oftentimes, there's a suggestion or it's common practice in certain fields to go ahead and center, that is, subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation, and that provides a standardized, um, well, intercept and a standardized slope for the model. All right, so as a quick summary, this simple linear regression model is actually much more complex than it would seem initially. And that complexity comes because you have complete freedom on how to choose the explanatory variable. You don't have to use the one that you're stuck with from whoever gave you the data or whatever data you collected. You can, in fact, change it and be uh, use whatever functional form that you want. Now, the next question might be, how do you decide what functional form to use? And so my quick... Um, rationale for how you decide is this. Number one, you choose F based on your scientific understanding of the problem. If there's some reason why a particular functional form would be expected, then you probably want to use that functional form. The second reason is for interpretability, and that's what this slide set was all really about. In particular, the shifting the intercept and the scaling the slope. That is, if you want improved interpretability, you can change what explanatory variable value you use, and that will in, in turn change the interpretation of that intercept and slope. Then finally, uh, we haven't gotten here yet, but there might be reasons for model diagnostics that you might want to go ahead uh, and choose a particular way to represent the explanatory variable value. This model here, we're assuming normality, we're assuming a constant variance, and it might be the case that certain functional forms uh, land it to those assumptions better and therefore we want to take a look at diagnostics to determine how uh, our model fits the data that we have. All right, the next slide set is going to be on prediction intervals in the context of regression. Hope to catch you there.